Hello everyone. Hello subscribers. Hello followers. Welcome. Today we are going to talk about nationalism, the different forms of nationalism, liberal nationalism, conservative nationalism, expansionist nationalism, um, anti-colonial nationalism, and the, um, the different theories about these different types of nationalism and then radical uh, nationalism that gives uh, that that will degenerate as it were in the two isms of the um, 20th century yes uh, namely um, fascism and nazism I say this because there tends to be a, conf a confusion about nationalism and the others, as if they were the same. Now, why am I going to talk about this? Because I, I, I think I, 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 I sort of understand it a little bit and I can explain it. Um, it's part of uh, political philosophy and I used to teach this um, to to kids, to adolescents, uh, pre-university um, adolescents. And um, there is, so this is going to be an ABC of, of uh, political philosophy, okay, on nationalism, okay. So if you are, <laughs> if you have studied this, if you have thought about it, uh, this, this, uh, this is an ABC, okay, so you're not going to learn much from it. But I, I do it only because there will be a lot of people who have not studied political philosophy. And there is a certain confusion about nationalism and fascism and all the other isms, okay. So I thought that it would be a good idea for me to sort of introduce you to it. Now, uh, at first sight, a nationalist movement um, appears to be a sort of a straightforward um, thing that we can all understand. Nationalists are obviously people who have a strong attachment to their nation of which they are part of. Okay, nothing wrong with that, perfect. So is it a feeling? Yes, to a, to a certain extent, but it tells us little about what an actual political movement is. Again, I have to, I have said this many times before, but remember the difference, please, between uh, a nation and a nation state. A nation, and we have to come back to this again and again, that is why I sort of define it once more. A nation is uh, a common identification of people who are like me, right? It, uh, it, it means uh, um, the same history, the same culture, the same language, the same faith perhaps. I, I my own tribe, people with whom I share collective memories of history. Yes, the nation state is something different. That is the country, a political and geographical entity. They're not the same because in one country, in one nation state, sometimes there can be many nations people from different histories and different cultures yes and um, the other way around too so they're two completely different things okay so we understand that we have to go back to understand nationalism uh, because we have to look at it from many different sources many different point of points of view for example an expression of nationalism can be um, a sense of superiority over other groups. Now, don't go straight and jump into Germany in the 20th century. This is not only Germany. This can happen to many other groups. So stay with me. We haven't got there yet. Okay? A sense of superiority towards other groups. Okay? That can be an expression of. 
but it can also be at the other end an expression of a desire to be free from domination from others and so you're going to use this nationalistic feeling to bring people who are like you together into one common entity okay so it can be good it can be good it could be ga- bad it can be indifferent okay we're just this this is what gives rise to nationalistic feelings for others as i said is a, a desire to bring people a diaspora of people who are all over the world to bring them together into one common entity somehow for others it is just an expression of pride in the good sense of pride of uh, you know in your culture and uh, you don't want to go around killing anybody but you you want to preserve that culture you are you're proud of it is 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 you you've got it from your parents and your grandparents so, so you don't want to do away with that and you have you, you feel proud about it as i said in a good sense pride so nationalism it, it is a it is an objective reality in that it exists okay but it's also an emotion a subjective emotion the nation state is is a political and geographical reality that's totally different so this gets complicated because sometimes we have to uh, we have to uh, to take into account race sometimes religion sometimes many other factors so that is why it gets a little bit complicated so the core values the core values of nationalism is first of all self determination we are we a common entity with shared experiences this can be expressed through sovereignty oppression that will lead oppression by others as i said that will lead to a feeling of common identity want to get rid of this domination the diaspora external threats imperialism and so on now there is so so self determination is one core value the other one is what we call in political philosophy the uh, organic society um what does that mean it's going to uh, look at culture religion culture faith and so on and and language and how that can bring people together okay so let us start i'm going to start with the first concept of liberal liberal conservatism now there was a classical liberalism that started in the 18th century let's say okay which has moved on and ended up with what we have now sometimes described as or called neoliberalism that ends up in the completely the, the other extreme the opposite of how it started so let me tell you about how classical liberalism started and i will walk you through as to where we are now with neoliberalism what i'm what i'm saying is that classical liberalism in europe started very much with the definition of the nation state and sovereignty and independence of once that this is my country this is your country this is everyone accepting that and ended up in what where we are today in a uh, globalist uh, idea or, or, or approach or attitude and that is called neoliberalism how did we go from one to its opposite all right so let me start first i will have to refer to notes okay because okay so um let's say that it started this this idea of uh, the uh, 
the nation state it didn't start there but we have it almost codified as it were uh, in the treaty of westphalia in 1649 it was accepted that this is a country and that is a country and that is a country and no you have no right to just go to this other country and so on okay but it's uh, but it was first given expression during the um uh, the French Revolution, certainly. In the mid-19th century, you know, to be a nationalist actually was to be a liberal. Uh, in the uh, 1848 revolutions in France, for example, it they fused the struggle uh, for national independence and unification with the demand for a, for a limited and constitutional government. The, uh, another, another example is um, Giuseppe Mancini, the prophet of the Italian, um, they call it the Risorgimento, yes, the rebirth of nationalism. Um, he was the first one perhaps to talk about this Italian unification. Uh, another one was Simon Bolivar in, in, in Latin America. This is in the 18th century, who led the Latin American independence movement in the, um, in, in the early uh, 19th century. He was born in 1783, died in 1830. And um, it helped to expel the, uh, the Spanish from uh, Hispanic America. Uh, Mancini, it's actually, the, he was born in 1805 and died in 1872. Let me introduce him to you because he is a major expositor of this liberal nationalism. Um, he was an Italian nationalist, the apostle of liberal republicanism. Massini was born in Genoa, Italy, and was the son of a doctor. He came into contact with revolutionary politics as a member of a secret society, the Carbonari. Um, secret society, I suppose it was the... Um, well, there are many within the Freemasons, but he was part of them. This led to his arrest and exile to France, and after his expansion, expulsion from France to Britain. He returned brief, briefly to Italy during the 1848 revolutions and helped to liberate Milan and became the head of a very short-lived Roman Republic. He was a committed Republican. Massini's influence thereafter faded as other nationalist leaders like Garibaldi, who was born in 1807 and died in 1882. Uh, Garibaldi um, looked to the House of Savoy to bring about Italian unification. So Mazzini's, uh, am I pronouncing it right, Mazzini or Mazzini, liberal nationalism had a profound influence throughout Europe and also on immigrant groups in the United States. Uh, and I will uh, deal with, uh, with him a little bit later uh, at the conclusion, okay? So he was an example of nationalism trying to unify, bring Italy together, one common people. Um, another form, and uh, totally different, of liberal nationalism is um, the US uh, President Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. They were drawn up in 1918 uh, after the First World War, and th they were seen as the basis for the reconstruction of Europe after the First World War, 
and provided a blueprint, as it were, for the sweeping territorial changes that were implemented later by the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. Um, national, uh, liberal nationalism is based on the fundamental assumption that humankind is naturally divided into a collection of nations, each possessed with a separate identity. Nations are therefore genuine organic communities, not the artificial creation of political leaders or ruling classes. So the characteristic theme of liberal nationalism is that it links the idea of the nation with a belief in popular sovereignty. What does that mean? It means that you are no longer, as a member of your nation, you are no longer uh, obeying the emperor or the king or the absolute ruler, but it means that that, what was the emperor, the absolute ruler, the king, now that power has m moved on to the state. And so your allegiance is to the state, to your nation, yes? not just to one person there. This was uh, an idea first, not first, but um, following the, uh, the political writings of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, more about him later. At the end of this talk, I'm going to read you a brief um, uh, extract from each of these uh, philosophers and theorists that uh, uh, that I am mentioning it now, mentioning now, because um, just just to give you the the progression of how these things, how they began and how they change and where we are now. Okay, um, so in in liberal nationalism, you have the individual, and you have the state. Yes, and the individual is willing to sacrifice himself sometimes, his own individual rights, as they have said, for the nation, for the common good. Um, in general terms, how it started, you can say that liberal nationalism was above all a principled form of nationalism. At the beginning, it did not uphold the interest of one nation against other nations. It proclaimed that each and every nation had the right to freedom and self-determination. And in this sense, all nations were equal. Sovereignty, yeah? The ultimate goal of liberal nationalism, classical liberal nationalism then, was a construction of a world of sovereign states. And Mancini formed uh, this uh, clandestine organization called Young Italy to promote the idea of a unified Italy. And he also founded uh, later on the Young Europe in the hope of spreading nationalist ideas throughout the continent. Similarly, at the uh, uh, Par Paris uh, Peace Conference, which drew up the Treaty of Versailles after the Second World War, Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson advanced the principle of self-determination, not simply because of the breakup of European em uh, European empires, not because they served the United States national interests, although he might have done, but because he believed that the, um, the, uh, uh, the, for example, the Poles, the Czechs, the Yugoslavs, the Hungarians, all also had the same right to political independence that the Americans had enjoyed. So from this perspective, 
nationalism is not only a means of enlarging political freedom, but also a mechanism uh, for securing a peaceful and stable world order. Wilson, for instance, believed that the First World War had been caused because of an old order that was dominated by autocratic and militaristic empires bent on expansion and war. So in his view, democratic nation states, however, would be essentially peaceful because possessing both cultural and, and, uh, and political unity, they lack the incentive to wage war or subjugate other nations. This is, all sounds rather romantic, I am aware of it, but <laughs> I am beginning <laughs> with, with the explanation. So in this light, nationalism is not seen, was not seen as a source of distrust or suspicion or rivalry. Rather, it was a force capable of promoting unity, that is how they saw it, within each nation, and, of course, brotherhood, the brotherhood of man, very romantic, amongst nations on the basis of mutual respect and for national rights and characteristics. This is all very good, okay? But... There is a sense, nevertheless, in which liberalism looks beyond the nation. And now we are going to see the projection to where we are today. It looks, there is a sense in which it also looks beyond the nation. And this happens for two reasons. The first is that a commitment to individualism implies that liberals, classical liberals, believe that all human beings, regardless of race, of creed, of social background, of social, of nationality, they all have equal worth. That comes from a moral stand of Christianity. Every human being has a soul. Every human being is the same in the eyes of God and so on. Then the law, everyone is equal before the law and so on. So liberalism, because of this, actually um, subscribes to a certain sense of universalism in that it accepts that individuals everywhere have the same status and the same entitlements. This is expressed today with the uh, concept of human rights everywhere. Very good, human rights, yes. But what is going to happen is that it eventually is going to enable one nation to go to other nation and point the finger and say, oh, human rights, you're not obeying human rights. Do you see where we're going? Okay, so in setting the individual above the nation, liberals establish the basis for actually violating national sovereignty. Uh, for example, sometimes for the good. So you could go to South Africa and say, this is wrong. You're not doing, you know, the right thing. Apartheid and all that, okay? But in some cases, it may not be. Or you may use it politically in order to put down another nation. In other words, whether it is for good or ill, the moment that you put universal principles and go to that nation and say, hey, you're not doing that right. You are already, for good or ill, imposing your own beliefs, as it were, on that particular nation. You are already challenging the sovereignty of that nation. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. So, um, the second reason is that liberals fear that a world 
in a sense, a world of sovereign nation states may degenerate into an international sort of state of nature. State of nature is, you know, before civilization, when we were all jumping from trees or whatever, I had the right to kill you if it was going to benefit me, if I was hungry or whatever, okay? State of nature for individuals, state of nature for nation states. So just as unlimited freedom allows individuals to abuse and enslave one another, national sovereignty, they felt, may be used as a, an excuse, as a cloak for expansionism and conquest. So freedom must always be subject to the law and this applies equally to individuals and to nations. So liberals have, as a result, been in the forefront of campaigns to establish a system of international law. So we're moving already away from each. You have your own nation state here. You do as you please. Oh, perhaps not. Perhaps we will establish some organizations, international law, that are going to check on you. And if you don't behave, you, sovereign nation state, you know, we might start applying sanctions. <laughs> All right. So they have been at the forefront of this establishing this system of international law supervised by supranational above national above nation state supranational bodies such as what was then the League of Nations which fell but after the second world war it became uh, the United Nations or um the European Union, or so many others, yes, banks, financial institutions, the World Health Organization, and all these supranational organizations created by this liberal yeah, uh, sense of nationalism. So in this view, nationalism must therefore never be allowed to become, as they say, insular or exclusive, but instead must be balanced against the competing emphasis on, on upon uh, cosmopolitanism. Now, criticisms of liberal uh, nationalism tend to fall into two categories. In the first category, Liberal nationalists may be accused of perhaps at the beginning being a little bit naive and romantic, the brotherhood of man, not taking into account human nature. They see the progressive and liberating face of nationalism uh, as, as this, this naive and romantic uh, thing. Um, they saw themselves as very tolerant and rational nationalism. However, they perhaps ignored the darker face of nationalism, that is the irrational, sometimes bond of tribalism that distinguishes us from them. And this was not understood. Liberals see nationalism as a universal principle, but an, an, an irrational, rational political system, but they do not understand very well, or they didn't, the emotional power of nationalism, which in time of war, for example, can persuade people to fight to kill, to, in a negative way, but also to defend your country, almost regardless of 
justice or the nation's cause. This uh, very powerful emotion that eventually can lead to things like my country right or wrong. They didn't understand that or perhaps they did. <laughs> Secondly, the goal of, na of liberal nationalism, uh, in other words, the construction of a world of nation states, may be misguided. The mistake of the Wilson, President Wilson's nationalism, on the basis of which large parts of the map of Europe were redrawn, was that it assumed that nations live in convenient and discrete geographical areas, and what states can, uh, and, and, and that states can be constructed to coincide with those areas. <laughs> in practice, all so-called nation states comprise actually a number of linguistic and religious and ethnic and regional groups, some of which may consider themselves nations by themselves. And this has nowhere been more clearly demonstrated than in, well, we are seeing it today. Okay, so to summarize this um, uh, liberal um, nationalism, you see that it started by saying to the emperor, to the ruler, to the dictator, imposing his or her will on everybody, on all the citizens or subjects. It was a reaction to that, hey, the individual citizen has rights. These rights of the individual was the core belief of liberal, uh, of liberalism, classical liberalism. Okay, and so uh, they nevertheless realized that people, the we, the common we, have uh, a need and affinity to, to um, express ourselves in connection to everybody else to realize that we are part of the same group. And so they transfer that emotion to, not to the ruler, but to the nation state. The nation state here, exemplified as the uh, representative government, is, is the one that you pay allegiance to. Yeah, and so, uh, that's, that's fine, we can go along with that. But then, because of this emphasis on the individual, they said, well, perhaps we can't trust, and this is where we see the progression, perhaps we can't trust every single independent sovereign government to make sure that their people have rights. And so we create international organizations to make sure that every single sovereign independent country uh, respects these rights of the individual. And okay, we couldn't go along with that, you know, just to make sure a country somewhere in a remote part of the world is not actually protecting its citizens or whatever. And so this human rights thing started. And that's fine too. The problem is when these international organizations having been created for this purpose, you can say are taken over by one particular entity or one particular country in order to serve their interests. And that is where it may go wrong. Let's go now to conservative nationalism. For much of the um, 19th century, conservatives were a little bit suspicious of this uh, liberal nationalism. Conservatives are traditionalists, and so they felt that it would lead to um, the destruction of traditional forms of 
authority that had always been there and would therefore threaten order. Um, however, as more nation states became established, uh, conservatives began to understand that nationalism could become actually a force for order, actually, rather than disorder. In the belief, in this belief, conservatives, let me look at my notes here, conservatives, uh, conservative nationalists were inspired by the works of Johann Fichte, a German, for whom the concept of a nation was a cultural idea. Peoples were bound together by their traditions and a common sense of their history. And this united them in a manner more powerful than anything that a government could think of. So while we saw, uh, while liberals saw nationalism as a way of creating and maintaining uh, individual collective, uh, individual and collective liberty, for conservatives, nationalism was a means by which societies could be held together. And so the binding, the bringing together effect of nationalism could serve actually two main purposes. The first was to prevent social conflict. And here we see, for example, um, this was the motivation behind the nationalism of the uh, English Prime Minister um, Benjamin Disraeli, who talked about the one nation state. Everyone, the, na the, uh, the government and the nation was to look after everybody, the ones at the bottom and the ones of, at the top. One nation. <laughs> yes, um, what in fact, you see, um, the ones at the bottom, the workers, with the advent of capitalism and so on, were beginning to complain that perhaps the government was only uh, obeying or following the interests of the ones at the top, of the ruling classes and so on. And they began to complain. There they, they, they began to be a sort of a conflict at the bottom. And so the Israelis genius was to tell those at the top don't try to keep all the benefits to yourselves there has to be an escape valve here for those at the bottom after all they are not asking for revolution they're asking for perhaps better wages better waiting uh, uh, better working conditions and so on you have to give in he reminded the ones at the top, giving a little bit, or you may lose it all. So it is a logical and it is a rational uh, means to keep the nation together, to provide escape valve for those at the bottom. Otherwise, you, you may have a revolution in your hands. Do you want a revolution like the French Revolution? No. So then give in a little bit. So instead of working 14 hours a day, perhaps 10, perhaps one week's holiday, perhaps this, perhaps that. It was a sort of a paternalistic attitude. Yeah. Um, now, um, the in Germany, the predominantly German form of conservative nationalism was uh, represented by Fichte, this, um, this uh, theorist, this uh, philosopher, and later by Bismarck, um, and then by Garibaldi in Italy, concentrated more on the development of the nation and the achievement of its historical destiny. Progress depended on national unity. Without it, society would drift aimlessly 
and without spirit. Of course, as time went by, this conservative form of nationalism was to become more radical in Germany and in Italy and contributed eventually to the rise of fascism. The most sinister aspect of this transformation occurred when the fascists, for example, saw national destiny in terms of national superiority and the defeat of weaker nations. Um, so, historically, conservative nationalism developed rather later than liberal nationalism. Until the latter half of the uh, 19th century, conservative politicians treated, as I said, nationalism as subversive, if not revolutionary. But as the century progressed, however, the link between conservatism and nationalism became increasingly apparent, as I said, with the one nation um, approach of the Israeli. Um, conservative nationalism is concerned less with the principled nationalism of universal self-determination and more with the promise of social cohesion and public order embodied in the sentiment of national patriotism. Above all, conservatives see the nation as an organic entity emerging out of a basic desire of humans to gravitate towards those who have the same views, the same habits, the same lifestyles, the same appearance as themselves. In short, human beings seek security and identity through membership of a national community. And from this perspective, Patriotic loyalty and a consciousness of nationhood is largely rooted in the idea of a shared past, turning nationalism into a defense of values and institutions that have been endorsed by history. Nationalism thus become, becomes a form of traditionalism in conservative ideal, in nationalism. This gives conservative nationalism a distinctive nostalgic and perhaps in some case backward-looking character. In the USA, for example, this is accomplished through an emphasis on the Pilgrim Fathers, the War of Independence, the Philadelphia Convention, and so on. In the case of British nationalism or more accurately perhaps English nationalism, national patriotism draws on symbols closely associated with the institution of the monarchy, for example. Conservative nationalism tends to develop in established, already established and perhaps mature nation states rather than in ones that are in the process of nation building. It is typically inspired by the perception that the nation is somehow under threat, either from within or from without. The traditional enemy within has been class antagonism and the ultimate danger of revolution. So in this respect, conservatives have seen nationalism as an antidote to socialism. When Patriotic loyalties are stronger than class solidarity. The working class is effectively then integrated into the nation. Calls for national unity and the belief that patriotism is a civic virtue are therefore recurrent themes in conservative thought. The enemies without the threatening national identity include, in many cases, in this, in this case, immigration, for example, 
or supranationalism. In this view, integration poses a threat because it tends to weaken an established national culture and ethnic identity, therefore provoking hostility and conflict. Do you see where we are going with this? Okay. So, anti-immigration campaigns uh, will start all based on this national unity concept. Although conservative nationalism has been linked to military adventure and expansion, its distinctive character is that it is inward-looking and insular. If conservative governments have used foreign policy as a device to stoke up public fervor. This is an act of political opportunism rather than because conservative nationalism is relentlessly aggressive or inherently mit militaristic. This leads to the criticism that conservative nationalism is essentially a form of elite manipulation or ruling class ideology. From this perspective, the nation is invented and certainly defined by political leaders and ruling elites with a view to manufacturing consent and engineering political passivity. In crude terms, when in trouble, all governments play the nationalistic card. A more serious criticism of conservative nationalism is that it promotes intolerance and bigotry. Insular nationalism draws upon a narrow concept of the nation, that is, the belief that a nation is an exclusive ethnic community, broadly similar to an extended family. A very clear line is therefore drawn between those who are members of the nation and those who are alien to it. And by insisting upon the maintenance of cultural purity, as it were, and of established traditions, conservatives may at times portray immigrants as foreigners or as a general threat and so promote or at least legitimize racialism and xenophobia. Now, okay, so we can see how to summarize conservative nationalism, then we see that it, uh, it started with um, giving expression to the nation, the culture, the people like us, and can end up already in extreme forms of hating the other. It's not necessarily us here, but you are different over there. You can see how the progression goes, okay? And we're going to see now the extreme forms of where this can end. And we end up in what some people call radical nationalism. Other people say integral um, nationalism. It goes more by the, w by the name of fascism in its many forms. Yes, because uh, um, it, it, will, it will reappear in different nations in different forms. In Germany, it was racialist. Yeah. In Italy, it was not necessarily so. So uh, let's now look into this extreme form of nationalism. If we say that I'm going to talk about it instead of saying radical uh, nationalism, um, 
it may not be necessarily understood straight away so i'm just going to use the word fascism how 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 did it start um well all fascists are uh, radical nationalists uh, in this sense radical describes a kind of nationalism that is neither liberal nor passive it is active it's going to not just rest there but actually do something with this emotive feeling uh, fascism is perhaps obsessed with the idea of uniting uh, people into a single organic whole indeed the term fascism is derived from the latin word the latin term for a bundle of rods which is bound together fascists therefore worship uh, any aspect of human life capable any aspect capable of binding people for which purpose the common circumstances of birth and history that a nation enjoys are clearly ideal historically the concept of nationhood certainly seems to have been the most powerful binding force perhaps rivaled only by family or religion indeed many fascists acknowledge uh, that uh, they actively seek a uh, and promote a sense of nationalism that is almost a religion or a replacement for it now a word of caution is needed here different fascists have used nationalism, as I said, in different ways. For the Italian and the Spanish fascist, for example, nationalism was merely a vehicle for uniting the state. For them, the state which expressed the collective will of the people was paramount. In the promotion of nationalism, if it could safeguard the nation, preserve the interests of the state, then it was a useful political force. In the Third Reich, however, nationalism took an altogether different form, a more perhaps important uh, position the unification, glorification, and final world triumph of the German nation where the ultimate goals of those were the ultimate goals of the Nazi that Nazi form of fascism the role of the state was to serve the interests of the nation and thus reversing the roles of the state and nation as existed in the fascist Italy and Spain Hitler deployed a range of emotional appeals designed to inspire his people. To this end, a series of historical myths was a powerful feature of the message. He also played upon the fears and resentments of the German people by claiming that threats to their power and integrity were presented by other great powers as well as separate uh, groups and identities and races. Above all, however, he unveiled a golden future for Germany in which he would reunite all its scattered peoples, restore its lost territories, conquer weaker peoples and take their land for further expansion. Referring back to a partly factual, partly mythical history, he promised to restore Germany to its former glories. 
He claimed that Germany had the potential to become the highest form of civilization the world had ever seen. For many Germans, this proved to have an overwhelmingly attractive appeal. Individuals might not be willing to sacrifice themselves to an abstract concept of the state, but they are willing to follow him anywhere in the name of German nationalism. Let me look at my notes here, because I have a book that explains the nature of fascism. This is a very important topic, because we might not confuse it with anything else, the development and so on. Let me see if I can. Um, the ideological status of fascism is controversial. Fascism is often used as a term of abuse now and nothing more. Bureaucrats and parents are on the receiving end of such abuse nowadays, as well as dictators like Hitler and Mussolini. Again, defining fascism is difficult because of the variety of the regimes and movements identified as such as fascists. So, for example, the peasant-based coalition uh, of uh, the Christian Iron Guard of interwar Romania, the reactionary Catholic Action, uh, uh, Catholic Action Francaise uh, of the early 20th century uh, in France, the also the atheist uh, r racist regime of the Nazis have all been labeled fascists. Despite the profound differences between these movements, there have been a number of attempts to identify fascism as it were an umbrella, whoops, an umbrella of different uh, ideo ideologies. Sometimes, uh, well, it is presented for the most part as a reactionary ideology not a progressive ideology. Uh, a uh, thinker, Griffin, uh, he sees fascism as embracing a form of ultra-nationalism in seeking to refashion the nation through its own dynamic activity. And he calls the fascist project of national regeneration as evoking past national glories within a modern context, in that this fascist renewal employs forces of modernity, such as advanced technology now. Um, he, um, yeah, let me move on. The development of fascism. The history of fascism must recognize the interwar years as crucial. It was in this period that the self-styled fascist movements in Italy and Germany came to power. What promoted the rise of fascism in this period were the problems which uh, came from uh, the modern age and which were becoming increasingly apparent by the end of the 19th century. The experience of industrialization and imperialism had brought wealth and glory, but at the same time promoted discord, resentment and problems. The grand enlightenment uh, vision of the rational world, of states and peoples in harmony with themselves, and one another, and who were committed to the peaceful resolution of disputes, was threatened by the persistence of discord and the growth of social divisions. Now, fascism in Nazi Germany and Mussolini's Italy. The divisive and dissonant forces at work in modernity may be seen to have promoted 
fascism and interwar Germany and Italy. In both regimes, there was a deprecation of reason. Force was praised. Youth movements and shock troops represented incarnations of the vitality of force. Violence was inflicted upon internal opponents of the regimes, and war was celebrated as the quintessential activity of the nation. Both regimes exemplified an overheated nationalism in which the pursuit of glory justified aggression and violence. Both regimes, um, in both regimes, aggressive nationalism, the cult of the leader and the celebration of force were responses for the demands of unity, purpose and a strength thrown up by divided and demoralized societies. Both Italy and Germany in the immediate post-First World War world suffered from the anguish of either defeat in the recent war or disappointed victory. Democracy struggled in both countries as social divisions and economic anxieties mounted. The affinities between the two regimes and their histories indicated above. There were, besides this, there were distinct differences between fascism in Germany and fascism in Italy. In Nazi Germany, the driving ideological force of the regime was racism. The German nation was organized by an elite and a leader who were determined to achieve a true community of Aryans. The establishment of such a community involved the systematic persecution and subsequent planned extermination of anything alien to that. Certainly the Jews were there. Jews were depicted as the dark side of the light shining on the Aryan race. Not only the Jews, the Poles, people with physical and mental disabilities. And so they were excluded from influence and positions, important positions within society and were liable to be arrested and sent to concentration camps. The repression and the terror exerted against the Jews was of a piece which the dictatorial measures taken by the Nazis to ensure that power in society was concentrated in just a few hands, their hands. The ideological aims inspiring the Nazi domination of society were the development of the racial power of the Aryans through internal purification and external expansion through a series of wars. While the power of the Nazis rested upon the force and repression underlying the regime, they also appeal positively to the German people through their promotion of a strong foreign policy, maximizing the image of German strength and through internal measures designed to boost employment and working conditions. Fascism in Italy differed from Nazism primarily due to the relative insignificance attached to race as an ideological force within the development. The Italian uh, fascism um, is exemplified more in what now when people try to 
um, define fascism, they usually say the unity of corporations and the state. Yes, um, becoming one. The interest of the state are the interest of the corporate elite. That was uh, Italian. Uh, if, if you have to define Italian fascism, it would be that, not necessarily on race. So um, before the end of the, let me see if I can see here my book. Before the end of the Second World War, the Italian parliament was swept away to be replaced by a system of representation through corporations. While the representative character of the corporate state was a fiction beneath which lurked the power of the fascist state and a tyrannical regime, the emphasis upon state organizations gave expression to this Italian fascism. Mussolini and Gentile, the philosophical ideologues of Italian fascism, both identified the fascist regime as totalitarian, by which they meant to convey all the encom all encompassing power of the Italian state over the lives of individuals. What Italian fascism shares with its Nazi counterpart is elitism, state of, uh, authoritarianism, and an aggressive nationalism promising renewal and an antipathy, a dislike to liberal democratic and socialist ideals. The existence of these common ideological values in combination with the recognition of differences, points up the worth of the general viewpoint on fascism um, that we have discussed before. There is a point, <coughs> there is a point to regarding these uh, fascist regimes as exemplifying forms of populist ultranationalism in which the rebirth of the nation was seen in emotional terms. The rebirth of the nation. Going back to our past glories. We have to do whatever it takes is active. The negative standpoint adopted to other ideologies and uh, is clear and there is a range of values which the two regime combine in distinctive ways, in distinct ways. So the commonalities exhibited between Nazism and fascism and fascist Italy justify seeing fascism as a general ideology, difference between its national expressions notwithstanding. Yeah. So they're different, but there is a commonality there. Okay. So let me. Okay. So let me let me recap now. Um, this extreme form of nationalism, the umbrella is fascism, and fascism we see that is going to. Um, be interpreted or act in different ways according to different countries and according to different ideologies. Yeah, fascism does not is not the same in every country. Let me just complete this uh, by uh, telling you a little bit, reading here about uh, Hitler and Mussolini, and then I will move on to other complete different forms of nationalism, like anti-colonial um, uh, nationalism, for example. Okay, but let me just read you Adolf Hitler, 1889-1945, was born in Austria and had set out his life story and worldview in a book called Mein Kampf, written in 1925. 
He led the Nazi party to power in Germany in 1933 and declared himself Führer in 1934. Hitler was aggressively anti-Semitic and his racist views and expansive nationalism were key factors in the development of fascism in Germany and in the course and course of the Second World War. His racist views dominated the ideology of Nazism. The Nazi regime undertook the systematic persecution of the Jews and the relent relentlessly expansionist foreign uh, policy. As for Mussolini, he was born in 1833, died in 1945 as well. He was born in the Italian village of Predapio in the region of Romagna. He became a radical socialist in the years before the First World War, but in the volatile atmosphere of post-war Italy, he set up a movement called the Fascio, Fascio di Combattimento, in 1919. His fascist movement traded on violence and quickly became a powerful force, and Mussolini assumed political power in Italy in 1922. By 1926, rule by decree had begun and democratic parliamentary rule came to an end. Mussolini's regime fell in the wake of defeat in the Second World War and he was executed in 1945 by communists. Okay, let us now move on and let's talk about anti-colonial nationalism. Completely different, yeah, different reason. The developing world uh, has spawn uh, various forms of uh, nationalism, all of which have in some way drawn inspiration from the struggle against colonial rule. The irony of this form of nationalism is that it has turned doctrines and principles first developed through the process of nation building in Europe against the European powers themselves. Colonialism, in other words, succeeded in turning nationalism into a political creed of global significance. In Africa and Asia, it helped to forge a sense of nationhood shaped by the desire for national liberation. Indeed, during the 20th century, the political geography of much of the world has been transformed by anti-colonialism. Independence movements that sprang up in the interwar period gain new impetus, and it's still happening today, after the conclusion of the Second World War. The overstretched empires of Britain, France, the Netherlands and Portugal crumbled in the face of rising nationalism. India had been promised independence during the Second World War, which was eventually granted in 1947. China only achieved genuine unity and independence after 1949 Communist Revolution, having fought an eight-year war against the occupying Japanese. The Republic of Indonesia was proclaimed in 1949 after a three-year war against the Netherlands. A military uprising forced the French to withdraw from Vietnam in 1954, even though final liberation with the unification of North and South Vietnam was not achieved until 1975 after 14 years of war against the USA. Nationalist struggles in Southeast Asia, 
inspired similar movements in Africa, with liberation movements emerging under leaders such as Krumu, uh, I'm sorry, Krugma in Ghana. I'm going to mispronounce the names. Dr. Asikiwe in Nigeria, Julius Nairere in Tanganyika, later Tanzania, and Hastings Banda in Nyasaland, later Malawi. The pace of decolonization in Africa accelerated from the late 1950s onwards. Nigeria gained independence from the UK in 1960 and after a prolonged war fought against the French. Algeria gained independence uh, in, in 1962. Algeria gained independence from the French. Kenya became independent in 1963, as did Tanzania and Malawi the next year. Africa's last remaining colony, Southwest Africa, finally became independent, uh, actually Namibia, which was part of South Africa in 1990, became independent. So early forms of anti-colonialism drew heavily on classical European nationalism and were inspired by the idea of national self-determination. However, emergent Africa and Asian nations were in a very different position from the newly created European states of the 19th century. For African and Asian nations, the quest for political independence was inextricably linked to a desire for social development and for an end to their subordination to the industrialized states of Europe and the USA. The goal of national liberation, therefore, had an economic as well as a political dimension. And this helps to explain why anti-colonial movements typically looked not to liberalism, but to socialism and particularly, in many cases, to Marxism-Leninism as a vehicle for expressing their nationalistic uh, ambitions. On the surface, nationalism and socialism appear to be incompatible political creeds. Socialists have traditionally preached internationalism. You remember? Uh, workers of the World Unite. That was based on the fact that, as Marx said, you know, if um, it's, it's, it's not good enough for the working class to achieve um, um, economic uh, independence in this particular country because what is going to happen is that those uh, rulers uh, will move their factories somewhere else. So you're going to end up without a job anyway. So it didn't make sense unless it was international. Uh, so, traditionally, the socialists always preached internationalism because they regard humanity, or they regard, yeah, humanity, or at least the proletariat, as a single entity and argue that the division of humankind into separate, separate nations only breeds suspicion and hostility. Marxists in particular have stressed that the bonds of class solidarity are stronger and more genuine than the ties of nationality, or as Marx put it in the Communist Manifesto of 1848, working men have no country, workers of the world unite. I think think that um, I don't think this is true. I don't think that class um, commonality is stronger than national one. In other words, I don't think that uh, what joins together the, the working classes is as strong 
as the feeling of the nation, the of nationhood. I think nationhood goes deeper, perhaps. The culture, the religion, all that. The appeal of socialism to the developing world is based on the fact that the values of community and cooperation which socialism embodies are deeply established in the cultures of traditional pre-industrial societies. In this sense, nationalism and socialism are linked insofar as both emphasize social solidarity and collective action. And by this standard, nationalism may simply be a weaker form of socialism, the former applying the social principle to the nation and the latter extending it to cover the whole of humanity. More specifically, socialism, and especially Marxism, provide an analysis of inequality and exploitation through which the colonial experience can be understood and, and colonial rule challenged. In the same way, as the oppressed and exploited proletariat saw that they could achieve liberation through the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism, third world, as used to be called nationalists, saw armed struggle as a means of achieving both political and economic emancipation, thus fusing the goals of political independence and social revolution. In countries like China, North Korea, Vietnam and Cambodia, anti-colonial movements openly embraced Marxism-Leninism. On achieving power, they moved to seize foreign assets and nationalize economic resources, creating Soviet-style planned economies. African and Middle Eastern states have developed a less ideological form of uh, nationalistic socialism, uh, practiced perhaps in Algeria, Libya, Zambia, Iraq, South Yemen. However, uh, nationalists in the developing world have not always been content to express their nationalism in a language of socialism or Marxism, borrowed from the West. Especially since the 1970s, Marxism-Leninism has often been displayed by forms of sometimes religious uh, fundamentalism. Um, we're thinking of, for example, Islamic fundamentalism. This has been given to the, the developing world um, a specifically non-Western, indeed anti-Western voice. In theory, at least, Islam attempts to foster a transnational political identity that unites all those who acknowledge the way of Islam and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad within an Islamic nation. However, the Iranian revolution of 1979, which brought the Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, who died in uh, 1989, uh, brought him to power, demonstrated the potency of Islamic fundamentalism as a creed of national and spiritual renewal. The establishment of the Islamic Republic was designed to purge Iran of the corrupting influence of Western materialism in general and of um, the great Satan, uh, USA in particular, through a return to the traditional values and principles embodied in the Sharia of divine uh, Islamic law. By no means, however, does Islamic nationalism uh, have a unified character. However, in um, Sudan and Pakistan, for example, uh, Islamification has essentially 
being used also as a tool of statecraft to consolidate the power of sometimes ruling elites. Nevertheless, in Egypt and Algeria, for example, revolutionary Islamic movements have emerged that, at least in the past, called for more renewal and political purification in the name of the Arabian pure, uh, poor. So uh, let us uh, summarize now. Okay, so as you can see, different forms of nationalism, some to try to impose, others to try to defend themselves and so on. Let me just now recap the whole thing by um, telling you about the just a few main theorists, uh, philosophers who have sometimes influenced the thought of uh, political action. We have seen, you remember, we have seen uh, liberal nationalism, conservative nationalism, extreme forms of radical nationalism, and anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, uh, a search for independence uh, nationalism. So let me just very briefly, you'll be interested in this, I think, um, just three or four main uh, writers. The first one that we always have to go back to is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, a citizen of Geneva. He lived between 1712 and 1778. His writings, The Social Contract, The Confessions, uh, in his autobiography, The Confessions, he tells us of a uh, when once he was sitting under a tree eating an apple and he started thinking, why is it that I cannot get to the, um, to the, to the ultimate power or uh, that's, not, uh, that's, that's not quite correct. Why I can't make it all the way up as much as I want. Um, um, he knew he was willing, he was able, he was intelligent, and nevertheless there was a, a, a line here beyond which he would not be able to aspire or get there ever. Why? His key ideas are the collective will of the community, and legitimate government, uh, which requires the active participation of the citizens. He, okay, let me explain. He was born in Geneva, and his political philosophy was highly influential during the Enlightenment, as well as on liberal thought. He is seen as the father of modern nationalism, particularly liberal nationalism, despite the fact that his writings did not specifically discuss the issue of the nation, but they did discuss the rights of the citizen. He is known for the general will of the people. What is that, the general will? The government, he said, governments should be based on the indivisible collective will of the community. This notion of community was based on the idea of a national community, a nation. He argued that these communities had the right to govern themselves. So he was associated with the idea of national self-determination, the liberal nationalism. In relation to government, for Rousseau, governments were obliged to listen to the collective will of the people and ensure that its laws applied universally to every citizen. The government's function 
is to enforce the collective will of the people, he said, not to direct it, but to enforce the collective will. Another point, civic nationalism. Rousseau argued that the state can only be legitimate when it is based on the active participation of its citizens. The active participation of its citizens. Not of a ruler out there telling you what to do. The active participation of the citizens. He went on to write at great length the social contract, everyone should read that, which expands on this idea. Okay, that's um, Rousseau. Another, another uh, philosopher, very influential, German, Johann Gottfried von Herder, Herder, H-E-R-D-E-R, Born in 1744, died in 1803. Key ideas. Every nation has its own unique character. The spirit of the nation. The spirit of the nation. What is that? Herder was associated primarily with culturalism. You may be part of another nation state, but you are like me. You speak the same language. Why are you in that nation and not in my own? We have to get together all the people who are culturally like us and form a nation there. Do you see? So he rejected the rational beliefs of liberal forms of nationalism and he focused instead of in, 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 in things like culture, organic groups invested with their own unique spirit. Different culture. Culturalism for Herder suggested that every nation was different and that each had its unique character and identity and that it should pursue and enhance that. We're beginning to see a movement, pursue active. You should pursue it and you should enhance it. Humanity, he says, was a single species but had developed different languages, cultures and ways of life because people evolve in different environments. And so relations between nations allowed an understanding of other nationalities and encouraged people to understand what was distinctive about their own nation. For Herder, identified the people Volk, V-O-L-K, as the root, the people, as the root of national culture and a special culture at that, the Volksgeist, that each nation should try to express. The folk could best be understood by studying their history, that is, their language, their culture, their customs, their religion, their literature, their law, their folklore. Herder argued that nation states are an expression of cultural differences. The expression of cultural differences, not the creator of them. Patriotism. Herder attached exceptional importance to the concept of nationality. He says, He that has lost his patriotic spirit has lost himself and the whole world's about himself. All right. 
<coughs> we see a progression there. Let's move on still further right to that progression. No, before him, Giuseppe Mancini. 1805 to 1872. The key ideas are to be free, people need nations. And nationalism takes precedence over other causes. He was born in Genoa, as I said, and is associated with the cause of Italian unification liberating the separate Italian states from foreign rule and fusing them into a free and independent republic. Massina is seen as a liberal nationalist, but this is only true to a certain extent. The idea of nationhood for him. He believed that humans could only express themselves via the nation. People, have to, people had to unite as nations to enjoy their rights. Thus, human freedom rested first and foremost on the creation of one's nation-state. In other words, you cannot do it by yourself, you and you and you individuals. You need the state to give expression to all that. For Massini, the nation-state was not merely a convenient form of government, but was a partnership of free and equal humans bound together in unity towards a single aim. As for patriotism and action, for him the nationalist cause had to take precedence over all other causes. He regarded patriotism as a duty, and love for the fatherland as a divine mission, almost. Massini rejected intellectualism and rationalism and created an idea known as thought and action. You remember Marx's theory and praxis. Thought and action, in which every thought must be followed by action. No good to be thinking here like all other philosophers about this and that and the other thing. If you don't do anything, well, you're not doing anything. An idea is only an idea. When you put it into action, that's a different thing. There's another thing that he felt strong about, spirituality. Massini's motto was Dio e Populo, God and People. And he believed that it was God who divided humanity into nations. Even though his writings can sometimes be, be understood as speaking out against the Catholic Church. He deeply remained, however, uh, uh, spiritual, distinguishing between religious sentiment and the Catholic Church. But we know that he was the... Um, the Carbonari, uh, and the uh, the Masons' uh, aim is to destroy the Catholic Church. We know that. I don't need to discuss that. Okay, but let's let's move on even more uh, extreme right, and now we get to Charles Moha. M A U R A S, Moha, French. Born in 1868, died in 1952, so he saw the Second World War. Key ideas are, nations come first, not individuals, military might and expansion. Okay, he was born in France and his ideas were influenced by the turbulent aftermath of France losing the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, swiftly followed by the Paris Commune of 1871. Morin was a key advocate of integral, integral nationalism, extreme, 
Yeah. Nationalism, a form of right wing, okay, extreme right wing nationalism that certainly influenced the uh, ideas of fascism. So, what is this integral or radical uh, nationalism that influenced the ideas of fascism? Mohab political ideas were based on this integral nationalism and some of its qualities include now anti-individualism now now against the individual and aggressive expansionism integral nationalist states were usually totalitarian where the state dominates all aspects of society. Mussolini's Italy was the first example of such a society. Japan in the 1940s would be another, as it often overlaps with fascism. A major tenet of integral nationalism is the total immersion of the individual in the interest of the nation. We have moved on from you as an individual wanting to sacrifice some liberties, this or that, for your nation. Sometimes you're called to go to war, okay? But this, this goes beyond you sacrificing sometimes your own individual rights. This is the total immersion of the individual to the states. It's the state. That's it. You don't exist. You're a tool, basically, for the state. See how we have moved on now. Individualism for Mora, he rejected individualism. That's nonsense. Because it led to individual thinking only of their own best interests rather than the nation and their place in it. He believed that the French Revolution had contributed to this malaise of individualism. Militarism. His form of nationalism often results after a nation has achieved independence and established a state, often these countries have a strong military ethos, which became entrenched through the struggle for independence. Sometimes the success of the struggle for liberation resulted in feelings of national superiority that led to extreme individualism. Okay, so we eventually got to fascism which is to sacrifice yourself completely for the nation there is a completely different uh, form of nationalism the anti-colonial nation nationalism um, marcus garvey uh, a, a black nationalist leader uh, born in 1887 died in 1940 his key ideas were people should be a black nationalist leader, people should be proud of their blackness, Africans are one nation wherever they are, the diaspora. Marcus Garvey was born in Jamaica but travelled around Central America and lived in London and America. Garvey was an early advocate of Pan-Africanism found in the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, as well as pioneering black nationalism. Um, this is the diaspora um, ideology, yes. So his two main themes were black pride, Garvey encouraged African people around the world to be proud of their race and to see beauty in their own kind. His central belief was that African people in every part of the world were one people and that they would never progress if they did not put aside their cultural and ethnic differences. Garvey's ultimate dream was for the creation of a United States of Africa. 
Garvey set the precedent for subsequent black nationalists and pan-Africanist uh, thought. What did he mean by pan-Africanism? Garvey advanced a pan-African philosophy. He wished to inspire a global mass movement and economic empowerment focusing on Africa, where he sought to end imperialist rule and create modern societies. He argued that black people would be respected only when they were economically strong and proposed an independent black economy. He connected black, black communities on three continents with his newspaper, The Negro World, and formed the Black Star Line shipping company to provide transport and to encourage trade among black businesses of Africa and the Americas. Another main point in his philosophy was separatism. Although Garvey was a supporter of racial separatism, he believed that humans were all equal and did not wish to create a hostile atmosphere with white people. The purpose of separation for him was to empower black people and to enable them to find an identity. Okay, so those are some, some of the major uh, thinkers that influence nationalism. Okay, so I hope you can see the difference. Patriotism, love of country is good. Liberal nationalism, conservative nationalism, radical nationalism expressed in different forms of fascism, and then completely different on the other side, you have anti-imperialist and anti-colonial nationalism trying to bring people together um, from a diaspora or from external threats and so on. So now you know the difference between nationalism and fascism, and don't you ever confuse them again. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.